Um, it's my great pleasure as Master Bodnick to welcome you to the first of our series of lectures to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Birkbeck joining the University of London. Um, and of course, often you know, anniversaries are 100 years, 200 years, whatever, and are fairly meaningless. Um, but actually, this one is of really great importance because, in a sense, our students, our part-time students studying in the evening can feel, because we give the University of London degree, that their efforts are indeed comparable or even, as we would say, superior to what goes on in all the prestigious colleges of the University of London. So it is a very important thing um, for us. And interestingly, if one thinks back, and Joanna Burke has been writing the history, which I read, um, the history of Birkbeck, in uh, how it came to join the University of London in 1896, um, George Armitage Smith became the master, or was then called principal. Um, he was the first principal to actually be paid as a full-time employee, so that's encouraging for me. Um, and encouraging for those of you who are academics, as I was just um, saying, the, um, the staff at that time, the lecturing staff, were paid a percentage of the take. So the more students you got in, and the more fees they paid, you got a percentage of the take. And we sort of, at that period, started to move towards this thing where you actually get a salary, which was a jolly good um, idea. And of course, Armitage Smith fought for Birkbeck to become part of the University of London, to be able to award University of London degrees. And it was not a sort of easy fight. The principal of King's College um, at the time said that it was a jolly good idea, Birkbeck could be a preparatory school for all the other colleges. And Kings and the other colleges would transfer their low-level courses to Birkbeck, and those who are, as he put it, not yet ready for Kings and UCL and whatever, would study at Birkbeck and eventually graduate. Well, that didn't happen. Birkbeck became a full college um, of the University of London in 1920, and we are delighted to celebrate that. Interestingly, Armitage Smith reorganized the college's teaching and activities into five faculties, paralleling the five schools that we have today, or slightly different subjects. Um, and of course, that's why it's particularly appropriate that to celebrate this anniversary, we have decided to have five lectures, one selected um, by staff members within each school. And so tonight, we have the first of those from the School of Science. And my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eloise Dumontal, who has had a very distinguished um, career at Birkbeck in the eight years that she's been here, starting as a temporary um, lecturer and rising to the level of reader in cognitive neuroscience, and presumably further rises, I'm sure, to, to come, not necessarily pay rises. Um, <laughs> and, depends on your performance tonight. And, um, <laughs> equally winning the Spearman Medal of the British Psychological Society. So we have been told, I have been told, that she is a wonderful lecturer, and so I'm not going to detain you any further from listening to our wonderful lecturer and the first of our centenary lectures by Dr. Yuri's Dementia. pressure for my performance tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, I will be talking about education neuroscience um, as an approach to improve maths and science achievement in primary school. I'm very happy to um, start this series of lectures um, about celebrating this 100th anniversary of Birkbeck joining the University of London. And I'll try to make from some reference um, to this idea of kind of opening education, which is the theme um, for this series of lectures. Um, so just to start with, what is educational neuroscience? Because it's quite a new field. Um, it's the, an attempt to bring together education, psychology, and neuroscience to study how to promote better learning. And this is a quote from um, a document from the 2011 from the Royal Society. And they say here that education is about enhancing learning, and neuroscience is about understanding the mental processes involved in learning. This common ground suggests a future in which educational practice can be transformed by science, just as medical practice was transformed by science about a century ago. And I'll come back to this kind of model um, analogy. Um, and here we're very lucky to have the Centre for Educational Neuroscience, which is a virtual centre uh, group being UCL, the Institute of Education, and Birkbeck. And I've joined this centre when I started um, here at Birkbeck. And within this centre, we kind of collaborate on various kind of research um, topics, and um, 
Uh, we now have kind of two books emerging from this, uh, from this work, trying to collate um, this type of research, so this in uh, 2013, and now um, I co-edited with Professor Michael Thomas and Denis Maréchal a new um, book about it, kind of education and science, which is coming up um, this year. So we have a lot of, kind of research going on, and we also have education. I am the director of the Masters in Educational Neuroscience here at Birkbeck, which is trying to train um, new kind of individuals at the kind of crossroads between these different fields. And we will have both the kind of neuroscience, kind of education, psychology, background understanding to be kind of help us bridge these different um, disciplines. And it's kind of a very exciting place to be. Um, so there's this analogy to medicine. And in the same way, and this analogy works in the sense that there's actually a few magic bullets. The teachers might be like, so tell me, what, what's, what have you learned? What, what should we do? And you know, there might be a few in medicine, like penicillin or vaccination, uh, but really it's an accumulation of small improvements that eventually added up to a revolution in medicine. And it will be the same for us, there's kind of multiple small effects. So things, and I won't go into the detail, but work memory training, educational video games, space learning, uh, reward-based learning, sleep, kind of diet, exercise, all sorts of things that individually might have kind of a small effect, but it's all kind of taking them together to try and kind of change a bit the, the picture. Um, but the analogies are not perfect, and um, education is different from medicine. So things like double-blind trials are often not possible. The teachers and the kids know what they're doing and that they're doing something different. Uh, there are different ethical issues associated. So we're not trying to kind of cure a disease, we're trying to kind of change some um, practice. Oh, sorry. And education is intrinsically a social classroom-based phenomenon compared to this kind of only societic uh, doctor-patient relationship. So again, the social context has kind of, potentially has a really big influence um, in here and is quite a complex parameter. But there's also the question about what are we trying to achieve? And that is kind of, you know, quite complex. So if you think, about this kind of histogram of um, you know, distribution of academic attainment in a population following this kind of normal distribution, you might have a cutoff saying actually we, you know, this is, we'd like everyone to attain this level of you know, reading, let's say, when they're age seven. Uh, so you know, what do we do, what can we do to kind of help? Are we actually trying to fund an intervention for everyone that might actually lead to a whole improvement, but there's still individual differences, so there's still a lot of differences, some children who do a lot worse than others. Or um, they might actually be genetically determined or are there limits to how much children might improve. So these ones might be there because they can't improve much. And so an intervention might actually lead to the good ones becoming even better. better and you might increase differences between um, individuals. Or um, you might just try to really focus on this lower tail and then lead to a reduction of individual differences. What should we aim for? And actually, what um, it might depend on what we're trying to train. Some things might you know, be more amenable to training than, than others. And this is really a societal question. It's not really an educational neuroscience question. What are we trying to achieve through education is kind of a, a bigger picture. And I think, in terms of work like this, kind of mode of creating opportunities for anybody to the advantage of everybody really speaks to, you know, anybody can kind of try and come and improve. Does that kind of, and how does that affect the whole group, the distribution? I think it's kind of all, you know, questions about that. Um, and Paul Hall returns has done quite a lot of kind of research, kind of theoretical um, idea about how to, about educational neuroscience. And this is a structure of how, um, things might feed from neuroscience research all the way to educational impact. And you can see there's a lot of different stages. And today, I will be talking uh, at kind of this level, some of our neuroscience research, trying to kind of develop resources and kind of potential practice and evaluate them. Uh, and kind of, you know, future would be kind of see whether we could implement that and that could be adopted um, in schools and have more educational impact. So the example I will be focusing on, um, comes from a, a kind of round of funding from the Education Endowment Foundation, which funds randomized controlled trial to test um, education intervention to see whether you know, they uh, have an impact and then welcome trust, uh, which was looking at using insight from neuroscience to improve education. So as part of the Center for Educational Neuroscience, we put a bid to try and kind of get some funding to develop um, uh, one of these randomized um, controlled trial and intervention. So this project is Unlock. Uh, and in Will Birkbeck, um, New Zealand Institute of Education, and Learners, which is a sort of think tank trying to kind of help these educational neuroscience and put people together uh, within the Centre for Educational Neuroscience. And it's a big project. 
So the Nima Rochelle is the, the PI and a whole team of kind of other investigators and postdocs and students involved in this project and you can see um, in a minute why we have so many people. So the background for this. There are a lot of countering concepts or facts in both science and maths. So just to start with, if you think about um, the sun and the earth, it looks like the sun is going around the earth. You sit there every morning, you see it coming up one side, it kind of goes, moves around, the, it looks like it's moving around the sky and it goes to the other side. So we've got this repeated experience that it, that's what it looks like. But then eventually in school you learn that you no, know, it's the earth that's going around, the sun. So it's kind of quite counterintuitive to what your everyday experience is. Um, and then kind of other concepts that are actually kind of could be conflicting. So children, you know, they drop things a lot to kind of try to test gravity. Uh, so they have some understanding that if you kind of drop something, it falls down. And if you get them to do a task like this, where you have tubes going down in different locations, and if you ask them, where is this ball going to go? Early on, they might say they're going here, because the concept of gravity is overpowering the idea of kind of object permanence. Um, and, you know, there are many animals that look like other animals, and like mammals that are in the sea, and dolphins look a lot like fish there. You see they've got kind of... Um, flippers, etc., but actually they're not fish. And that kind of, again, is kind of counterintuitive in terms of these kind of categories of different animals. So before starting school, children might have misconception or kind of counterintuitive understanding for gravity, inertia, balance. Uh, during school, um, might be about life and death, temperature, state of matter. In adulthood, we still have some sort of like gravity, electric circuits, and I'll show you an example. Um, so in this one, we've been, I've talked like this, and people are like, no, that's not true. Um, so if I show um, these, so you've got two bottles, one exactly the same, one has about 250 milliliters of water in it, the other one has nothing. And they could fall like this. So oh, I didn't work. Or, or they're <laughs> falling like this. So very hard PowerPoint is about limits to what it lets you animate. Um, the, uh, so do you think they're going to land exactly the same time? Or is the heavier one going to land first? Who thinks they're going to land at the same time? Who thinks they're one of the heavy ones going to fall first? <coughs> so this is really, really strong intuition that heavy things fall faster, and actually they don't. They kind of um, they will land exactly at the same time. And there's kind of um, an interesting video with um, about this that I thought I'd show you um, because it's kind of so strong. These kind of counterintuitive effects. Um, So this is a video from this, I was forgetting his name, the big physicist guy. Um, but they are dropping feathers and a like, big ball of lead at the same time. So if you do that in... In this case, the heavy one falls faster, right? But it's not just because it's heavy because feathers have got a lot of air resistance and that's what really is misleading us in everyday life because heavy things, not light things, tend to be kind of the bigger, more fluffy things and they kind of fall more slowly. But if you do it in a vacuum, and I think when you see that video, it's always like, really? It kind of really shocks you because they fall exactly at the same rate uh, despite their very different way, uh, weight. And I think it looks, you know, it looks a, kind of really counterintuitive seeing this type of videos. So there's lots of things like that um, around in science. Um, but also in maths. So for example, things like that can be misleading where um, if you ask children which of these is a larger angle, uh, they might say why is, because it's like a bigger arm and so that's kind of a, a, a bigger angle. Or in this case, if you tell people, okay, these two shapes have got the same surface area, uh, do you think their perimeters are the same, um, or is the square one a larger perimeter, or is the rectangular one a larger perimeter? Well, a lot of people might say they're the same, because they've got the same surface area, they just have the same perimeter. But in fact, no, they don't kind of follow the same route. Uh, this one's got a white larger perimeter. Um, and if you think, kind of, you know, you could um, show these, you know, which one, is that true or false? And I'm not going to go through all the detail, but is two-thirds smaller or larger than five ninths? Children might think, okay, these are the big numbers, so this must be the bigger one. Um, this one's for 2.40 versus 2.1. 
while this has got 40, this is one, so this one is the bigger one. Um, this one, you kind of forgot, it's kind of zero, so this one you just add up the top ones, you add up the bottom ones. There's loads and loads of kind of errors like this. Um, and they come from different type of things. Some might be more perceptual, some of them might be based on things you've learned before. You've learned that 40 is bigger than one, so you know, if you do time kind of transferring that here. And so that happens kind of in very different fields. Um, and what's quite interesting is that there, this idea is that you've got these overlapping um, waves of kind of strategies and understanding. So going back to that ball falling, there's the kind of gravity understanding and there's the kind of um, conservation of the, of the object. Um, and at different ages, they're kind of both there and one of them might kind of dominate and the other one kind of disappears. So it's not like you can have a complete transition from one to the other. So the question is, how do you select one theory or strategy over another? Like you've started you know, learning at school that it's the Earth going around the sun. Um, how do you just completely ignore the first one? Well, the research suggests actually we're not completely ignoring. Both of them are still in there and we need to favor one versus the other. So what comes in here, what helps us, we think, is that kind of the, the understanding at the moment is inhibitory control. Um, I'm sure a lot of you might have seen these type of things where you see uh, words written in kind of different colors and the task is to say what is the color of the font, uh, ignoring what the word is. So here you have to say red, yellow, blue, green, green. This is easy because they're uh, congruent, what we call. But this one, you have to say yellow, red, green, yellow. And you can see it's much slower because I've got this conflict between what's written that I can't stop reading because I can read. Uh, and the color that I'm supposed to be naming. So this is one task of inhibitory control. Another one like, that children do is Simon Says, right? So you have, when, when the children don't say Simon Says, the children have to not do it. They have to resist jumping down because there wasn't Simon Says first. And so they have to stop themselves this kind of dominant response. Um, so inhibitory control will help us resist the dominant response and decide between competing representation or answers, like in this case, where I've got the blue, but I also have yellow, and I have to favor one versus the other. So we think that's involved in uh, making this kind of, um, helping you decide on a theory or strategy. Relating to this, there's this idea that we might have kind of two brain system, a really fast, kind of a more evolutionary, older system for reasoning, decision making, that rely more, it's kind of, um, relies more on nutrition, uh, in kind of more eventually, in, in, um, involuntary, effortless, um, and a slower system that allows you to make a kind of more uh, kind of other type of reason decision, which is evolutionary older, takes longer, needs more effort, and this this balance between the two systems. And inhibitory control in times of kind of counterintuitive problems might help us resist our kind of first intuitive response that is incorrect, and instead uh, kind of think about what the correct answer um, should be in, in a more reasoned way. So we've got this balance between the two. So what is the evidence that that might be happening in terms of counterintuitive problems? Um, this is a study done uh, in Canada, two studies done in Canada, where uh, showing physics students and non-physics students um, different stimuli. So they might be showing electrical stimuli, and some of them are non-scientific. So for example, this one, in a standard circuit, you actually need two wires to light up um, a light bulb. You can't just have one like this. So this is incorrect. Uh, and in this one, where the heavier ball falls before the lighter, the lighter ball, which again, as we've seen, is just incorrect. And you look at what's happening, and you can show them the correct ones, incorrect ones, really, really incorrect ones that are not even kind of intuitive, um, and uh, trying to see what happens in their brain. And what they find was they compare the physics undergraduates compared to the uh, non-physics undergraduates, is that there's more activation in kind of frontal cortex regions of the brain when they're sh faced with these non-scientific circuits and have to make a decision about it. Because the idea is that they, they are intuitively correct, um, but they've learned to kind of <coughs> inhibit that and give the correct answer. And that requires some effort and recruitment of these more frontal um, parts of the brain. So we've got some evidence um, of this. Uh, but, and in another kind of more recent study, uh, work by uh, one of my PhD students in adolescence, we got them to do uh, counterintuitive problems in maths and science, and we got them to do uh, some uh, inhibitory control tasks in the scanner when they had to stop a dominant response, and we tried to see whether actually was it the same regions that were activated when they were doing both. And I'm not going to go through the detail, but the, they kind of got red ones, are the uh, Concentrative blue ones is the inhibitory control, and we saw some overlap in part of the frontal cortex and part of the parietal cortex. 
suggesting that we have some of the same neural networks involved when we're doing um, resisting this kind of intuition, intuitive response, and when we're doing uh, inhibitory control tasks. Um, and so, uh, kind of combining all this data together, um, there's kind of Denis wrote a kind of review paper suggesting that when you're learning a new concept, this kind of counterintuitive concepts in maths and science, um, you have to potentially inhibit what you have, um, your kind of prior beliefs and experience and direct perceptions when they're kind of misleading. And you're using your inhibitory control kind of control system, uh, kind of really, uh, supported by the frontal cortex, um, to help you do this. Um, so you can kind of um, master and kind of learn these kind of more um, difficult concepts. <clears throat> can we improve this? Can we shift people from this kind of perceptual, kind of uh, posterior quick reasoning, intuitive reasoning, to more slower logical reasoning? Um, this is some kind of study by, uh, done by Olivier Wooday in Paris, and um, it was kind of doing an doing adult to kind of logical problems. You might, I don't know if anyone come across this type of problems. Um, we're told that these cards have got a letter on one side, a number on the other, and uh, you're told which we ask which cards have to be turned to verify the rule. If there is an A on one side of the card, then there is a 3 on the other. And here, the intuitive response is that you read A and 3, and you want to turn the A and the 3 uh, to check whether there's a 3 on the other side of this and whether there is an um, A on the other side of this. But actually, to test this rule, um, you have to check this one to check that there isn't an A on the other side because if there's an A, then the rule is wrong. If you check this one, it doesn't tell you because it could be that there's a C, but doesn't, the, the rule doesn't say anything about what comes after a C. And so people tend to do this wrong, and so they um, were uh, trying to train people uh, to do this better. So they had a pretest and a post-test and a different task, and they were telling them in this problem, the source of the error lies in a habit we all have when concentrating on cards, with a letter or number mentioned in a rule, uh, not paying attention, we fall into that trap. Uh, to help you, we we'll kind of go through and you have to eliminate the wrong ones, the ones that make you fall into the trap. And have like this 20 minutes training. Um, and what's kind of, they found is really important is that um, the logic, just explaining the logic is not enough. They had to tell people the warning of watch out, it's a trap. You have the intuition is wrong here. And when they did that, um, and it's kind of a very small number of participants, but they kind of scanned them uh, with an MRI scanner to see what was happening in their brain before, when they were solving these problems, before and after the training. And when they compared the two, then they found that after the training, they recruited more of the frontal part of the brain. So this is the front and at the back, so kind of this lateral part, and also in the middle uh, part of the brain when they were doing the more logical reasoning and the rest of it. Um, so this is with adults. Can you do anything with um, children? So this is a video from uh, Adult Diamond, who is a big researcher in the field of, kind of cognitive control. A child is shown a picture of the sun and asked to say night. And when shown a picture of the moon, he should say day or morning. So this is an inhibitory control task, right? Yes. To do the what do you say when you see this? Night. Yes. Day. The little boy is going on automatic and making mistakes. He was rushing himself. He wasn't taking the time he needed. But giving him time to stop and think helps. So what I did was to say this little bit. Think about the answer. Don't tell me. You might think that it's interference, but instead, gives him the time to figure out the answer. Now can you tell me what he said? Think about the answer, don't tell me now. So it's just to illustrate that idea that if you try and stop a little bit and kind of give time for the more kind of reason, uh, logical processing kind of um, to give kind of give the decision, then you might do better, and that could work even with quite little children. Um, and um, <clears throat> so that's kind of you know the backgrounds for uh, our intervention. And one last bit of the kind of puzzle or kind of um, the kind of interest is going back to these individual differences. Um, and there is kind of knowledge from kind of loads of different research that children from lower socioeconomic status neighbourhoods have poor executive functioning, and that includes inhibitory control. Um, lower academic achievement and lower school engagement. And 
primary school age children in particular show really big disparities in interference control, this kind of um, uh, in the inhibitory control aspect, um, as a function of um, socioeconomic status levels. And there's some evidence, but that still makes and it goes back to that curve. You know, can you shift it? Uh, do other people, some maybe they have a limit, genetic or otherwise, to not improving more? So there, there's kind of a bit of mixture result, but there's some evidence suggests that those with the poorest executive functions may gain most from executive function training. So this is where comes our intervention, trying to kind of help children in science and math. Um, inhibit, resist intuitive responses to instead give the correct answer. So we call this stop and think intervention. Um, and it was based on the cognitive psychology, educational psychology and cognitive neuroscience literature. So we developed this intervention program to make children aware of the existence of these counterintuitive concepts, these tricky concepts, and to train them to use their inhibitory control skills to successfully solve these counterintuitive problems. And the way we designed it, that was done 10 for 10 weeks, three times a week in school at the start of the maths or science lesson. And with 12 minutes per session covering one science counterintuitive concept and one math counterintuitive concept. Why did we do both? Well, you know, as I showed, there's some of these counterintuitive things are there in both. Uh, and science is an understudied topic. And with interest in STEM and trying to favor STEM, it was really, you know, trying to see whether we can help kind of in, in both. And we did it for year three and year five um, primary school children. And the way it works, I've got a video, but I think I don't really have time too much time to explain it, but there's an introductory video telling children that there are these tie situations where your first answer is incorrect, and that's okay, that happens to everyone, uh, but if you try to take the time to stop and think, uh, and that's what the game, this kind of um, the computerized game is, uh, it will help you and you kind of try to practice stopping and thinking, and then you can try and apply that in science and math, but even in other fields. And it's got this kind of game show concept to try and make it um, more entertaining, where you've got these kind of other players trying to also answer these problems. Um, and then uh, this character is saying, that here's a question, remember to stop and think about your answer. So again and again in the game, it's like, remember to stop and think about your answer. And actually, when they're first shown a problem, they can't respond. So you have the stop and think logo that's kind of pulsing, and they can't respond yet, so they have to kind of wait. Uh, and then they show the other players thinking about it, uh, and then they go to the problem again, and then eventually they can, they're allowed to give their answer. And then if they gave the answer incorrect, they told, oh, that's not quite right, have another go, remember to stop and think. Uh, or they might be showing, oh, let's see what the other contestants think, and one of them has the misconception, one of them might not know or say something completely wrong, uh, and another one has the correct concept. So I might give kind of the idea maybe a cue to the um, children, uh, and then they have another go, or if they still get it wrong, then um, say, you know, let's see who's got the right idea, and then they get another chance, and then um, kind of moves on. So they go into one of these in much in a lot of detail, and after that, they do what we call structured practice, or bonus round for them, uh, where they just do a lot of similar concentrative topic, um, and to try and kind of jewel them and practice stopping and thinking, and every time they cannot answer immediately, they have a few seconds where they have to wait giving that extra time um, to um, involve and recruit these um, more prefrontal system. So we first did a pilot study, and one of the main aim of the study was to think about, try to uh, decide on whether we could do this in an individual basis, so a child on a computer, one-on-one, -on -one, or whether we should do a classroom-based. And so we had more than 400 children doing this, and they were doing either stop, it, stop and think um, individualized, or teacher-led, or teaching as usual as the control condition, um, in year three and year five children. And we tried to kind of do measures before and after the training. And so they did standardized maths and science tests, uh, an inhibitor control task, which is quite a weird one, uh, which is equivalent to the kind of strip one that I was talking about with the, 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 the words. The problem is that young children uh, are not necessarily very good at reading. So they're actually really good at the strip task because the reading doesn't interfere much, so like they just think about the color. Um, so you have to think about something else. And in this one, you know, they have to say um, which uh, body of kind of it is of the animal. And we have a kind of bias towards the head in terms of kind of thinking about animals. And so here you have to resist saying pig and actually say sheep um, when they're kind of um, inconsistent. And they also we created a counterintuitive reasoning task where uh, multiple choice. 
And so, for example, here's like how many um, animals do you see? And some things are considered as kind of more animals than others, or if they move. But kind of the season, loads of loads of different things um, to try and test their counterintuitive reasoning before and after they did the training. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, and so what happens, we first looked at the data pre-training, because 450 kids, that's a lot of children for this type of um, studies. Uh, we did find that they tended to give these misconception responses that we were expected, expecting. We also found an association between the performance on the weird animal, chimeric animal task, and uh, math, some of the math and science measures. And we also found that the school level uh, percentage of free school meals, which gives an, an idea of SES, we didn't have the individual data, but we had the kind of school level data associated with counterintuitive reasoning and math achievement in both year groups. Um, there was not enough data for science to, to, to do the comparison. So these kind of all these kind of backgrounds fitted with um, the, kind of the the previous research, but then the main results uh, found that for year three children, um, stop and think led to better counterintuitive reasoning. So we call this near transfer because it's quite similar to the task, the misconception training they were doing in the the, the game, in both the teacher-led and pupil-led training versus teaching as usual. So this would be um, the teacher-led pupil-led and combining the two together on this kind of counterintuitive reasoning task. Year five, we didn't see um, that. But in year three, we also saw um, that in transferred to science achievement in the standardized tests, which is quite far from the task they were doing, the very kind of counterintuitive problem specific training they were doing before. In maths, there is a kind of trend effect in year five, but, um, uh, but it didn't kind of reach um, um, significance. The, you can see, however, that there's a lot of cell missing. And one of the things we faced when doing this pilot was that actually uh, having an individualized training is really difficult. And a lot of schools either don't have the tech to do it, or it's kind of quite a big involvement. Imagine rolling out all the iPads to do that and have three times a week for a kind of 12 minutes training. And on that basis, um, even though the effects are kind of quite similar on that basis, we decided actually we should go for kind of whole class um, teacher-led, and also a way of kind of involving a teacher in this intervention, rather than having just a kid doing it on their own computer, it means it's actually more similar to what the teachers and the children are experiencing in their everyday kind of education system, um, and that's something that's kind of been suggested that's potentially important, um, that if you do something, you know, on a computer by yourself, it might not transfer to kind of in the classroom with your teacher. So if it's already done in the classroom with your teacher, then maybe you have kind of more chance of it kind of being beneficial. Uh, so we were happy because we had an effect. Um, and that kind of led us to the, to the next stage. And the next stage was this randomized control trial. And that means we have a kind of much larger system where uh, the schools and classes are randomly allocated to the different conditions to kind of minimize any bias that there might be um, to start with. But we really pushed, which was the funders weren't, didn't really want that, but we really pushed to have an, what we call an active control condition. Because the problem is if you just have teaching as usual, um, there's something called um, the Orthorn effect, which is a little bit like the placebo effect, that you know you're doing something different, you're doing a computerized thing, you're doing something different with your teacher. Maybe you kind of, you'll perform better on the test at the end because you were doing something different and you're a bit excited about it. Um, and so we really pushed to try to have something where you have well, this active control, which is matched in many ways, and to try to see whether we really have an effect of our intervention, rather than just it's something different you're doing with, on a computer. Um, and so we matched the duration, frequency, and the kind of the, the software. Uh, and this was done during personal, social, and health education, so PSHE classes, or at other times, but not kind of maths and science. And it involved, and I'm not going to go into detail, we do a whole other talk about this aspect of things, um, it involves social scenarios, predicting what comes next, and kind of recognizing um, emotions. So kind of uh, quite very different from the kind of science and maths, but still something new that involved a computer, a whole class kind of discussion, etc. So the trial was run all over England. Um, you can see here with loads of research assistants kind of traveling all over the place. Uh, the pre-training measure, unfortunately, we needed to have something because things change in the education system. Kind of in the meantime, we needed to have something called the foundation stage profile score, which is kind of really early on in kind of preschool and um, start of primary school. Um, the post-training was these uh, standardized maths or science tests. 
So children did one or the other because it takes an hour and it was too much commitment to get every child to do both, two hours of testing at the end. And the whole thing was kind of evaluated by the NFDR, which is called our independent evaluators. So we set it all up, um, but they were doing um, the kind of data collection of this, the kind of post assessment and all the analysis to try to kind of make it as kind of fair and biased as possible. There were 87 primary school, and then 84 were analyzed because of dropout. Um, and we tried to recruit schools, again, going back to this kind of opening and kind of uh, looking at the whole spectrum, in particular, maybe children from lower socioeconomic stages, to over recruit in schools with kind of higher percentage of free school meals. And um, so the on average in the samples is around 30% of free school meals, which is higher than the, um, the average. So these children did the 10 weeks training. 50% uh, of them uh, classes did stop and think, 25% of the classes did the social emotional training, and 25% uh, did teaching um, as usual. So the first thing coming out of the, um, and kind of quite frustrating, these are kind of the overall numbers. So we had six, potentially more than 6,000, I mean six and a half thousand children, which is pretty big for us. Um, but then on a the day of testing, apparently it's quite normal that around 50% of children are not in class that day. And so suddenly you have a just, you, drew, you, drew, you lose 15% of your sample just because, you know, a lot of children are like they're sick or something happened or whatever, they're not in class. Which is a little bit frustrating. Um, but so we end up with kind of more than 5,000 um, children. These are the kind of raw data of just the maths and science test, year three, year five, whether they did stop and think or the control condition. Um, it's quite hard to see. I mean, you can, the first thing it tells you is that any effect, you know, are not massive because that's expected. You know, it's a 10 week intervention. As I said, you know, all these educational neuroscience, we're not gonna suddenly make them, you know, get their head by a year by doing kind of 40 minutes of training. Um, but um, yeah, there's potential effects. Um, but in the main analysis, they covered for the starting foundation year foundation score as well kind of um, gender and other kind of variables. And these are the main results. So here I'm plotting the effect size, so the effect of the intervention, controlling for the kind of pre-effect, uh, in different like differences uh, before the training. For year three, year five in maths, or combining year three and five, year three, year five in science, or combining year three and year five. And um, stop and think led to statistically significant two months improvement uh, in science, which is this one here, when you're combining the two year group. Uh, but it did, and one month improvement in maths, but it didn't reach um, significance. If you think about it, you know, two months improvement for 10 weeks training, that's, you know, if it initially felt like well, two months is not a lot, but actually the intervention was three months. So, you know, that kind of feels actually quite, um, um, quite nice. Uh, and if you split between year group, you can see that the effect was mostly kind of really driven by year five. So it was significant in science here, um, and again, just kind of borderline for, uh, for maths. So the year five children seem to benefit more from the training. Um, a secondary analysis look at free school meal status. Um, so that corresponded, I said, in the 30%, roughly 200 um, children were on kind of free school meals or at some point free school meals in the education versus the total, all the children was around 700 for each of these conditions. So here I'm plotting the same one again, the all is the same one as just shown you before, uh, but the ones with the dash are just the free school meal children. And you can see that most of the time actually it's kind of quite similar, but in this group, the year three maps, actually the effect size is kind of nearly as big as or bigger than the year five. Um, and we don't really have the power to kind of be kind of in any kind of strong claim about this because you know, that's not huge numbers. Uh, but we thought it was quite exciting that if anything is looked at for these kind of um, children, the year three children who maybe have struggle a bit more with maths and maybe have a bit less good inhibitory control, um, the intervention might actually be kind of maybe kind of quite positive for them. Last secondary analysis, I told you about the active control that we really pushed to have these active control. Uh, does it survive, do we survives? If we have the active control, actually it's a bit better. Um, so this is looking against the social emotional and you can see it's significant for um, science combined, science year three, maths combined, and maths year three, oh, year five, sorry, the year five significant. Okay, so basically, you know, again, quite promising. If anything, it's more year five than, um, than year three. And then the last bit is like, you know, can we get feedback from teachers? Did the teachers like it? What happened for, for them? Did they think it was a useful um, thing to do? 
and that's a bit more mixed. So they found that it was quick training. Some of them actually just had their handbook, and it was not like they needed you know, an extra hour or half a day to be trained on this new intervention. Um, and they mostly delivered it as intended, and that they found that it could actually worked quite well. Uh, but overall, a majority of the teachers did not endorse the rollout of the current program to other schools uh, because of difficulty in fitting delivery into the school day, and that's something we don't have much power with. Like, ch teachers have a very packed day of what they're trying to kind of fit in, and I think anything extra we're asking them to do you know, will be as difficult. Uh, there were software problems, people engagement, accuracy of content, quality of animation and content being too easy as other things that kind of were um, suggested. Uh, some of them kind of, you know, a lot of them related to kind of software um, itself. Uh, a majority of teachers thought that stop and think content was appropriately aligned with the curriculum for science and suitable for their class. Half found it was suitable for maths and just under half thought it was too easy. So that's kind of quite interesting. So overall the effect was a bit stronger for science and for maths. So maybe when we kind of prepare the problems, maybe they, you know, we try to adapt it to what they were covering in the curriculum that year, but maybe it was like a little bit too easy, and that meant they weren't kind of stimulated and trained on something difficult enough that we showed a benefit. But other feedback that we received, the contextual feedback, quotes from teachers, uh, things like stop and think, help pupils to further develop social skills, such as listening and considering other people's point of view. Some pupils took the stop and think idea into other lessons, um, they were taking time to consider questions before answering. The Stop and Think game showed contestants and animation in the program encouraged pupils to reason more, which enhanced their learning. And I think that's all kind of really interesting because it really shows, you know, the teacher understood the kind of the, what we were um, getting at and seeing that even potentially transfer to other contexts and the children were maybe able to kind of incorporate this which is something really difficult in our field. Transfer is the holy grail. You train on something, everything else improves. We tend to think that you train on something and you become good at that, but everything else doesn't kind of improve. Uh, so that thing is kind of quite promising. And in terms of the teachers themselves, um, they said things like, it allowed me to develop my understanding of how the children in my class learn and how to analyze what they know, how clearly they understand concepts and to identify misconceptions that some or most or all children in my class have. It gave me an insight into how children's ideas can change when giving, um, given thinking time and how they are able to reason as to why something is right or wrong. So, you know, based on this, we're kind of working on trying to improve the program. So first, by allowing teachers to pick the topics, it was imposed automatically. They didn't really like that. Um, maybe speeding up the pace of the activities was maybe, I didn't show you, didn't have time to really to show you what it looked like, but it could have been speeded up in, in some places and trying to increase the difficulty of the math problems to kind of maybe um, uh, challenge them more. And maybe later on trying to have more advanced animation and graphics, but that, you know, we're not gamers, so we're not like making kind of video games, and that is actually quite resource heavy, and that is a big challenge for any of this type of education research. It's like kind of creating video games, they have so much resources to make really engaging, kind of good looking games, we don't have the same resources to do ours. Um, as well as like, eventually also kind of trialing this individualized adaptive training that we kind of drop for the kind of big intervention, but it's still interesting because it gives you benefit in terms of making the level and the kind of the speed adapted to a particular child rather than the whole um, classroom. So just to summarize this randomized control trial, um, stop and think is a 10 week, 40 minutes per week intervention and it led to improvement of two months in science, which was significant, and one month in maths. Uh, on standardized tests, um, so showing some medium or far transfer across years three and five, but the effects were mostly driven by year five. Uh, it was significant against the kind of active control condition rather than just comparing teaching as usual. And we didn't have really enough power, uh, but the intervention might benefit children or kind of lower socioeconomic status, in particular um, in year maths year three. The full report is out, and again, it was this NFER who evaluated this independently. Uh, and just to conclude, based on educational psychology, cognitive psychology, and cognitive neuroscience research, we developed a novel intervention to encourage children to stop and think to inhibit incorrect intuitive responses in maths and science. Uh, the pilot and the independently evaluated randomized control trial showed promising results. But from the feedback from the teacher, the intervention could be improved for kind of further implementation. And we're currently analyzing cognitive and neurogen data on a smaller sample 
um, to try and provide kind of further understanding of the mechanism, like how the intervention might have helped um, um, these children. And then also looking at the impact of their social emotional uh, training um, task. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, everyone on the Unlock Project, the funders, as well as the schools and the children um, who took part. And I'm happy to take um, any questions.
Do you think that in the future, like in a couple of years' time, you will go back to the same schools and see whether those children who did these tests would actually have improved compared to the ones who didn't do it? Yeah, so that would be another kind of holy grain is long-term effect. And uh, we have asked the Education Endowment Foundation, so they're the one running these trials, and they select certain trials where they later on ask for the data from the uh, Department of Education for education uh, so that you can do this long-term follow-up. And we would really, really like to do that. Even if they don't get it, we might try and get it ourselves uh, because it's basically at the end of their primary school kind of year, um, the primary school time, um, they've got the key stage three or um, some kind of standardized tests or um, and then we could try and see whether we have any long-term impact. And that's definitely something we'd be interested in, in doing. Is there, um, if you, thank you very much, um, but is there any benefit, do you think, in um, including these kind of studies in early, in early years developments? Yeah, that's interesting. So we had a really big debate with Denny, who wanted to do year one children. Uh, and I wasn't really for it, partly because I was going to scan them, and getting them to stay still in the scanner was already, <laughs> was already a bit tricky with the seven, eight-year-olds. And so the, the you know five six years <coughs> would have been even harder. Uh, but also, I was wondering whether the inhibitory control skills were sufficient that they could then apply them in this context. So here, the whole idea, and I, I didn't go that into too much detail, but we weren't trying to train inhibitory control per se. We were trying them to use inhibitory control in the context of maths and science when their problems are a bit counterintuitive. So there's a question about, about that, but you know, this video about Adel Diamond, the child is preschool and he managed when being kind of given and forced to pause to then do better. Whether then he would be able to remember to do that himself, that's kind of another question. So I think it, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, but the other thing is that they don't do much science necessarily. Kind of early. Uh, I was thinking a bit more in terms of, that's of the importance of early years. And pre and pre early years, even yeah. that, that, that that's when a lot of the um, neural pathways that would, that would sort of help this kind of um, yeah. conceptual, you know, that sort of intuitive understanding to, uh, you know, to, to develop. Yeah, I think so. Some of that is related to SES again, like social economic status, and this idea like uh, about scaffolding, so executive function, which is individual control, is one part of. Other things being like working memories, remembering things for a short time, or switching flexibility. Um, this idea that it's the parents, actually some kind of research showing that the parents scaffold their children executive skills, kind of attention, kind of control, and individual control, etc., through games and through the interaction with them. Uh, and so there are some studies trying to actually do intervention like this um, to maybe explain to parents what type of things they could do that might train the children executive skills and that might then at preschool because some of the effects are when the children arrive at preschool there are already differences in due to social economic status um, and uh, so that's kind of one avenue so that's kind of inhibitory control be one of them but kind of this the whole set of maybe activities that might train your um your, your executive skills at this sensitive like potentially sensitive period I have one more question okay one Oh, ah. <laughs> go for it. I was just trying to. We might be able to sneak another one. As you were talking, the conflict between children learning to think and move fast with video and electronic games, mm -hmm. and you're, you're sort of trying to do undo as well as do, aren't you? Because their instincts seem to be increasingly just do it, and you're asking them to not just think about the questions, which are counterintuitive, but the behaviour. So yeah, I think that's really interesting in terms of the speed of tasks. Uh, and I don't so the online kind of games, this whole kind of it's becoming a bigger and bigger field. At the moment we have very little evidence really. Uh, and whether there are some games actually have not no time limit, whether some have time limits and they've had that kind of play a role. Uh, but I know that one thing that we've been thinking about this, particular um, uh, in maths, is that quite often you have this really speeded responses, right? In maths, where you have to kind of, you know, get quickly the first thing. You, well, I did that one with a kid. You left your board with the kind of answer, and actually, 
a speeded response, encouraging a speeded response is maybe not always optimal because actually in some cases um, you might need to encourage kind of stopping and thinking. But it's a difficult balance because eventually being quite quick at that new multiplication tables, simple additions, means you can you can spend more time on the harder stuff because you don't have to think too hard about the, your multiplication tables. So there's some benefit in um, kind of memorization or acquiring some skills and really automatizing them, but then also benefit in other contexts, to kind of making sure there's time to stop and think about the answer. So it is a difficult balance, I think. Well, did you have a question? No. no okay. So the last question. It's not a little comment, really. I was just interested that some of the teachers didn't have the time to stop and think about the value of the Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that is, uh, and that's one of the reasons that we find, I find that it's quite difficult to get to recruit schools and work with teachers is that they, are so much, they don't have time to do just their normal job. And so asking them to spend a bit of time helping us organize testing or do something different. It's kind of you know, really tricky, but I think they did appreciate that. That in terms of the training, what they had to do was quite minimal. Um, but that you know, stopping and thinking whether that might affect, you know, help themselves was kind of an interesting point. Okay, so I think we're, we'll, we'll stop there for at least we'll stop. It was there for a second. So let's thank her once again for coming. <laughs> So I've been asked actually to give a few closing comments uh, to kind of tidy this up and kind of put it within the, the context of the Birkbeck mission. Um, for me, the key message here is a basic message. The message is the brain is important. The brain is important for behavior. It's important for learning. It's also important for understanding why we don't learn certain things. And that may be obvious to you, but not that long ago, in the 1970s, people believed strongly that we could study thinking, cognition, everything that was about human intelligence without any reference to the brain at all. And the kind of analogy that was used was to think about mastering a computer program. So mastering how to use um, PowerPoint. I could become a master, I could understand exactly how it worked, <coughs> tweak with it, do all kinds of things without needing to know anything about the circuits in the computer. That kind of implementation level was irrelevant to understanding the functional level. And people believe this was the case in understanding human behavior. The brain, sure, was there, played a role, but it wasn't important. It turns out that is wrong, fundamentally wrong. And um, I'm biased, because the reason yeah. I've been asked to, to make some closing comments is not just because I was associated with this project, but because I'm the director of the Center for Brain and Cognitive Development at Birkbeck. So this is a core center whose main mission is to try to understand the relationship between the developing brain from infancy to adolescence, and how this can help us understand the unfolding behaviors of children across the ages but also why certain behaviors don't unfold in the way that we would expect them to typically unfold. Um, and we work very, very closely with, of course, the Center for Educational Neuroscience, and it was as a close um, colleague of mine. Um, so the brain is important. The other key message is I think this is a fantastic illustration of kind of Birkbeck's dual missions. The mission of carrying out world-class research with the highest quality education that provides access to all kinds of different people. But the issue is not just, as illustrated here, it's not just providing access to the education, but it's ensuring that the individuals that come to class can benefit from that education as much as possible. So sometimes when we speak to teachers, they say to us, well, yeah, the brain, sure, you know, small effects, right? Really what's most important are social issues. How do you get little Johnny to actually come to school five days a week? Right? That is actually, we you know, recognize a huge effect. The thing is, if little Johnny is coming to school only three days a week, you want to make sure they get the most learning from those three days that's possible. And you can only do that by understanding how learning happens in the brain. Um, so uh, this ties in perfectly with Bert Beck's uh, core mission. And just before we sign off, I just wanted to give you a little illustration that these kind of misconceptions are so deeply ingrained and pervasive that even an expert in them, like me, cannot get the kids to understand these problems. So I was in a school a few weeks ago um, and the teacher had been doing a lesson on fractions. Right? And she was trying to get them to understand that one half is bigger than one quarter, which is bigger than one eighth. Right? The denominator, the bottom number, is getting bigger, but actually the fractions are getting smaller. So she got them to stand up in front of a room full of six year olds 
year two to explain it because Mr. Marischal was a special guest who could explain all of this. Um, and I started explaining with concrete examples. You know, we had groups of two kids and I tore a piece of paper and they had half a sheet each and four children, like quarter of a piece each and eight and whatever. And, and they were really picking up on this. And I said to them, so what do you think would happen if we tore it to ten pieces? Would they have smaller? And they all went, yes. Um, and then I thought, I got them now. And so I said, so what do you think if, I, if we had a fraction of one over a hundred? And they all went, ooh. <laughs> and I said, so do you think the fraction would be huge or tiny? And they went, huge. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like, you know, completely pervasive. Um, right, the other thing I was going to say, just to finish off, is um, an example that we always give, or often give to to you, give an intuitive sense of what this inhibitory control is, is to ask question, um, people a quick question, which is really, what do cows drink? Not milk, of course. Everyone's thinking milk. They drink water, right? So we have these spontaneous associations that come up that need to be inhibited before you get the real drink. Fortunately, cows may drink water. Humans don't just drink water. They do drink wine and fruit juice, and there is wine and fruit juice next door. <laughs> so we will invite you to Please move over next door, help yourself to the refreshments, disinhibit yourself, feel free to come up and ask questions, speak to each other, this is what these events are about. Thank you very much.